Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are names that are really very familiar to the Christian professing world. More usually because of the books of the New Testament that each of them wrote and had named after them than the men personally themselves uh, and that really is the way it should be shouldn't it the message is far more important than the messenger and unlike so many other so-called Christian evangelists over time Matthew Mark Luke and John although known and recognized never became idle shepherds uh, not idle as an ideally meaning inactive but idle as in someone who, who comes to overshadow what they've been given to teach uh, or over those who they've been given to serve, as we see so often today. Great religious leaders, so-called, seem to have a, a, an ability to mesmerize people. And people look more to the individual than to the truth that they should be preaching if indeed they're preaching it because a lot of them aren't they can mesmerize a lot of people but they don't teach the truth because people look more to the star quality of some televangelist you see them on television now than to the message they're preaching and of course uh, the Roman Catholic Pope he mesmerizes people who come into his presence and it doesn't really matter what he says. People just stand there mesmerized by it. I, I, again, I think I mentioned this some a year or so ago uh, in a Bible, in a written Bible study that uh, I remember the first time that U.S. President George W. Bush went to Europe. I think he was just, just shortly after his inauguration the first time. And he stopped in Rome. And I remember the photograph that showed his meeting with the Pope. They were on a terrace overlooking some uh, very scenic background. And I remember seeing the, the, the picture of President Bush, I mean, the man with the incredible amount of power uh, that a U.S. president has, economic and military power, and standing there literally wide-eyed and open-mouthed looking at the Pope. And that's an amazing thing because... It's a picture I'll never forget uh, because President Bush is not even a Catholic, but he was mesmerized by that man rather than what the man teaches. It's almost as if it didn't really matter. I think President Bush is a Methodist. There was President Bush mesmerized by the Pope. And it's it, there's certainly lesser examples of that uh, over time and around the world. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, are known for what they've given us in terms of the record of the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. It's about their witnessing Jesus Christ, what he taught, uh, how he died for us, and those four individuals don't overshadow what they have, that information that they've given to us. So, and I don't think they would want to, would they? because they were true servants of God. So I think they'd be quite happy with the way that's turned out. 
But today, let's have a look at these four men. Just to find out a little more about them on a personal level. To simply know them a little better as the Christian brothers that they are to us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are sometimes referred to as the evangelists. Uh, a word derived from the Greek word meaning someone who proclaims the good news or the gospel, uh, which comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, uh, God's spell, or which means good news, uh, the old way of saying things, the old, the old English. There were, of course, uh, many, many other evangelists uh, as recorded in the scriptures, preachers of the gospel. Uh, even Jesus Christ uh, could be called an evangelist by that literal definition of the word. But in the church of God, an evangelist was two things, really. It was a specific title, a specific service, but it was actually done, at, in, the, in the other sense, done by others who also had other forms or titles of service. For example, from Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, we read, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We see there that evangelist is listed as a specific service, even though, of course, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers were also, by the nature of what they preached and taught, also evangelists, even though they are listed with evangelist as, as forms of service. So there's there's some overlap in terms of not just the title of the function, but the function itself, which many others did. Really, they were all evangelists if they preached the gospel. But using the term specifically in terms of, of what someone is, is not inaccurate in how it's used there, since some obviously specialized in evangelism more than anything else. And, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John certainly do fit in that category. The four gospel books that they provided to, to generation after generation after generation provide us with that function that they had, uh, even though they were also apostles in their own time, uh, although not all among the twelve apostles, uh, keeping in mind, too, that Matthew and John were among the twelve while Luke and Mark weren't uh, among the twelve apostles. And that itself is a surprise to many people, isn't it? Because many people do regard them as among the twelve, and they really weren't. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's books are also sometimes called the synoptic gospels. Uh, synoptic is from a Greek word meaning to see together. Uh, the optic uh, in synoptic means eye. Uh, it's more found, even today, found commonly in words like optometrist uh, and so on because Matthew, Mark and Luke's books are similar in how they are formatted in terms of events and the perspective that they take uh, they sound similar although they are obviously written by very different men uh, they aren't identical as if someone, one of them dictated to the other two that obviously didn't happen because there are differences and they are obviously written by three men and what we will see about them today uh, they were three very independent men nobody told the other one or other two uh, what to say or what to think that would never have worked the only thing they had in common from that way would, would, would of course be the Holy Spirit but again the Holy Spirit is not an oppressive spirit it's a, it's a freedom it's a form of freedom uh, because it enables people to see the truth and they were teachers of that truth there are also, in John's account, is different. Primarily, uh, a number of reasons for that may be uh, that John wrote his gospel from a different perspective because he had more time. He lived, he was the only one of the apostles uh, to survive past his 40s. Uh, John was the only one, apparently, that lived to be old. He was well into his 90s by the time he died. There are reasons for that. Number one, uh, he survived to take care of Mary. He was actually a member of the family, as we will get to. Plus, he had another another book to write, uh, the book of Revelation, which he was given to write later on. So, John is a special case, and in that sense, 
it's not really not all that surprising why his gospel record uh, would be different. Uh, he had a lot more time to work on it. Uh, the others uh, had to get it done more quickly because whether they realized it or not, they were going to be martyred. Uh, John, we don't know what happened in the end, as we will get to. Uh, we do know he, he made it to old age, uh, whether he li- died peacefully in old age or not, or whether they still martyred him, which wouldn't surprise me really a bit. The Romans had no respect for anybody, old or young, man or woman, uh, considering all that they martyred uh, through the time. Uh, it made no difference. They had no mercy upon anybody. So, but I, I think John, really the reason for that, the synoptic gospels, the difference between John and the, the other three uh, is simply a matter that John John's perspective was a little longer in terms of time, as we'll be able to get to uh, as we deal with them individually today. But as we shall see also, they were also very different men. Uh, they were not just sort of of one mind in the sense that they didn't think individually. They were had different backgrounds. Uh, they were there was some age difference, uh, for example, between uh, Matthew and Luke and uh, Mark, who was younger, and so on. Uh, their educational backgrounds, in terms of being able to write, keeping in mind back at the time when a whole, there weren't many people who could write who were who were, who were uh, uh, able to to write anything at all. It was quite different. Matthew, of course, he was a tax collector. He would have been well familiar with writing and record-keeping particularly. Luke was a doctor, so again, he would be familiar with writing. Mark was not, from what we can read, did not have any sort of background or experience in that area. John was a fisherman, so he would not have had uh, really uh, that much experience or need apart from business records, uh, which were kept then as well, so perhaps a little bit more. But again, I think the primary difference for John was simply the matter of time. Uh, He had a a very long life. He lived to his 90s, which is amazing back then. I think you'll find uh, individual stories for these four men to be rather interesting and uh, perhaps a little surprising, some of the things we'll get to today. Matthew was a publican uh, or tax collector at Capernaum, uh, the town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee that Jesus Christ went to live uh, after he was actually run out of his hometown, Nazareth. Uh, And yes, uh, he left Nazareth in that way. He was run out. He had to leave simply because the people there would have killed him. And they tried to throw him over a cliff. So Jesus left Nazareth, which overlooks the uh, valley uh, of Armageddon, and moved over to the north shore of the Sea of Galilee at Capernaum. You can read the account of uh, Jesus' last day at Nazareth uh, in Luke 4, 14-31. They would have killed him if he had stayed there. Matthew records uh, his own calling uh, by Jesus Christ at Capernaum, Uh, in his gospel account. Uh, He he does it very skillfully in the third person. It would seem, uh, again, the humility of it. Uh, He didn't just make a big deal out of his own calling. He simply put it in as a a factual statement and just didn't use a whole lot of space to do it in. Uh, Again, we can see from that Matthew was a humble man. Um, Tax collectors were regarded as sinners. Uh, They were regarded uh, as among the lowest of society, even though they held what we would call a government position today. Tax collectors still aren't, of course, all that popular in in this day and age, but uh, back then it was primarily because they were crooked. They were thieves. A lot of them were working. They were independent operators collecting taxes in that way. Unlike now when most countries, the government uh, has its own people uh, who work for the government directly. They're not working on their own for a percentage, as back then tax collectors were, and they were a lot of them were simply crooked. Uh, They were very much disliked. And it doesn't say Matthew was that way at all, although again 
if, if, as we read, will read here shortly, uh, he was certainly not regarded uh, any higher than so-called sinners. So we don't really know about that. Matthew uh, was not uh, the first of the twelve called. Um, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, uh, all of whom were fishermen, were called first. Uh, as Matthew uh, also records in Matthew four eighteen to 22 but Matthew's calling was just as important uh, and perhaps even more so because uh, except for John uh, Matthew was given to write the Gospels whereas Peter for example at least directly as we will also get to in the ter- in, in, in Mark's account and where Mark got most of his information uh, only John of those four wrote a, a Gospel account whereas Matthew did so he was actually, uh, in terms of prominence, in terms of, of the written record, uh, Matthew was was uh, ahead of, of Peter, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, although the, Jesus told them not to be, there was not to be any competition among them. Uh, he rebuked them actually uh, when that the, the, that sort of a thing started, as to who was going to be uh, the leader and who was going to be. Uh, the leader of the apostles and all that, and Jesus rebuked them. He told them not to do it. He said, you were all brothers. Don't do that. Uh, he said, that's the way the Gentiles run things, but they were not to do that. And as we can see in the future, which is the subject of another sermon, uh, they will be equal, the 12 of them. They will they will each have their own responsibilities in the kingdom of God. It's not going to be Peter or any of the others over anybody else. Uh, Matthew's calling was just as important. But anyway, later uh, that day, uh, after his calling, Matthew held a dinner uh, in his own home at Capernaum, uh, which may have been a sort of farewell event uh, for his or to his fellow tax collectors, since they, they were all there, along with Jesus. As we read uh, from Matthew 9, 9 to 13, Matthew's calling uh, happened right after Jesus had had done a miraculous healing earlier that day of a paralytic. And it's interesting uh, interesting again how Matthew's unpopular profession, uh, they were, many of them were independent operators, they were crooked, they were just not tax collectors in the sense that they are today, even though tax collectors aren't popular nowadays either, but they're not crooked uh, as they were back then. They have no incentive to be because they, they work directly for the government. But back then they were independent operators, and it just—you can imagine uh, once you get into that sort of a thing, what may come of it when the opportunities are given there. But for Matthew nine nine to thirteen, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me, and he rose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So again, there's uh, a very clear uh, indication of how tax collectors and and sinners, so-called, are are just uh, viewed in a very low way back then at that time. So uh, although Matthew, again, uh, in that account, refers to himself as Matthew... Uh, he was also known as Levi. Uh, he was a Jew, uh, and Mark and Luke call him by that Jewish name, by Levi. From Mark two, fourteen to 15, and he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Uh, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus, and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So you can see from that it's the same account, but one uses his Jewish name, Levi. Matthew was thereafter included among the twelve apostles in the listings of them. 
uh, from Luke 6, 14 to 16. Simon, who we also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Matthew is not referred again uh, in the Gospels, either of his own or anyone else's, uh, until after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. From Acts 1, 12-14, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they came in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zealots, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Despite little else uh, being written uh, about Matthew during, during the ministry of Jesus Christ, Matthew obviously was there through it all, he saw it all. He went through it all. Since his gospel account is full and complete, highly detailed, and is read actually at least as much, uh, if not more, than the other gospels, because it's published uh, usually first in the order of the four. Uh, people who begin reading the New Testament begin reading uh, with Matthew's uh, gospel account. So, actually, more people read Matthew than 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 the others. Uh, and again, though, that it, it shows that Matthew was there to do his job, uh, not to make himself more than, than Christ had given him to do. He was there to record what happened during the ministry of Christ. It was not a matter of him recording uh, about all that he did. Uh, he wasn't just there to, to, to tell everybody about Matthew. He was there to tell everybody about Christ, and he did that. And he was obviously there, as we said. He couldn't have written what he did, uh, without being there and, and, and witnessing it, everything. One uh, also has to wonder if Jesus Christ chose Matthew uh, because he was a tax collector, apart from the fact that, that he was a sinner, again, because the, the tax collectors back then were were despised, really, and crooked, although we don't know if Matthew, how bad he was, but, uh, but chosen because he was a tax collector, and was therefore well accustomed to keeping accurate records and detailed records and was able to preserve those records. It would seem to be more than just a coincidence that that Matthew was chosen just for that reason. He, was, he would be perfect for the job, really. Again, keeping in mind that back then, uh, writing was not something that people could do. It's not like today, where everybody knows how to write. Uh, back then, not everybody did, and a few people really had any need to. Matthew's gospel uh, account was apparently written uh, before 70 AD since Matthew 24, which again is one of the most detailed prophecies done by Jesus Christ and almost also one of the most well-known, referred to the d- destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as a future event. So uh, most regard uh, Matthew's writing, actual writing of it, Earlier on, uh, certainly not later than 60 A.D., although I'm sure they must have kept notes uh, to, to remember things. If you've ever tried to remember something you did a year ago uh, in a highly detailed way, such as we find in the, in the Gospel accounts, you know how difficult that can be. And uh, I, I've got, I, I know in writing daily Bible study, uh, I've got notes all over the place. I've got them on computers. I've got them written on the back of everything you can imagine. I'm dry, I, oftentimes I'll get a, a uh, an idea for a point in a study, and I, uh, I'll be driving along, and I'll write it on the back of something as best I can. Uh, my car, the front seat, has usually got all kinds of little notes and notebooks and everything. Because if I wait an hour, probably I won't remember it again. Sometimes they just come and they go, and... And something as accurate and as highly detailed as Matthew's account and, and the other the other gospel accounts as well, they had to have been taking notes along the way through that time because, because Christ's ministry lasted over three years. So, I mean, you try to think back three years, something very, very detailed, uh, 
to do that without notes. It just doesn't seem likely. And how long they would have kept those those records personally and what happened to them after, cer- certainly there were copies made earlier on before they were martyred. Uh, the details, though, and the differences between those men, um, Matthew uh, uses uh, more references, uh, prophetic references, to the Christ from the Old Testament than do the other three gospel writers uh, to emphasize how Jesus of Nazareth was fulfilling the coming of the Messiah, which tends to indicate that Matthew was writing, or at least writing with with a Jewish audience in mind at that time. Because and why wouldn't he? You know, you don't you don't have the perspective that's there now. He was looking as at Christianity was not a new religion. It wasn't. It's regarded as somehow as a new religion from Judaism. But it wasn't. The Jews, the believing Jews, didn't regard it as a new religion. They, they simply recognized Jesus of Nazareth as their long-awaited Messiah. That wasn't a new religion. It was just the fulfillment of all that was written. And Matthew, more than the other three, tends to use the, old, the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament so-called, to prove it. And, and other references from that in his writing of the New Testament Gospel of Matthew. But again, you you wouldn't have Matthew would not have written what he did, thinking this is a new religion because it wasn't. It simply was not. But again, it it does show how the gospel writers are different. They were individuals. Uh, nobody was telling anybody else what to think or what to write or how to do it. And you can see those differences in those men. Even the Synoptic Gospels, even though they are similar, they are not the same. You can tell, if you read them carefully, you can tell them apart very, very easily because they were three very, very strong-willed, independent men. Uh, Nobody was telling anybody else what to write at all. You can tell the difference between them. And, And again, Matthew concentrated on one thing, others concentrated on others. Uh, The Bible does not record what happened to Matthew eventually. Uh, There are a few traditions uh, as as to his fate. The most prominent one is that he was beheaded uh, in Ethiopia uh, with a halberd, which is a uh, long-handled, sort of like a war axe. It's a long-handled pole with a sort of an axe head on the end of it, like a a spear and an axe head together, and then he was beheaded or or killed with that in some way. Uh, We don't know that for sure, but his being martyred is a certainty. As is the case with some of the others, the writer of the second gospel book, Mark, is also personally known by two names. Mark, or Marcus, was his Roman name, while John was his Jewish name. So, sometimes they were used separately for him, but at other times they were used together. Uh, Examples here, just from the book of Acts. From Acts 12.12, John, whose surname was Mark. And from Acts 13.5, they also had John to their minister. And from Acts 15.39, so Barnabas took Mark. So he's known there as John, or John Mark, or Mark, throughout Acts. And later, also through some of the epistles. Mark was the son of a woman named Mary. Mary was a common Jewish name, or Miriam, uh, in that time. And was very likely born in Jerusalem, where his mother still lived later, Uh, when she's mentioned as a member of the early Christian church uh, in Acts 12.12. Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. She was a very devout lady, apparently. So uh, there's nothing mentioned of uh, Mark's father in that, so we don't know what happened to him or where, who he was. Mark uh, was also the cousin of Barnabas uh, and from him came to know the Apostle Paul. Uh, Barnabas was one, the one who brought the newly converted Saul, or Paul, uh, the former deadly enemy of Christianity, who would thereafter become 
the Apostle Paul and really one of the greatest Christians this world will ever know and a writer of much of the New Testament. It was Barnabas who introduced Mark, his young cousin Mark, to Paul. And unfortunately, um, Paul and Mark uh, did not hit it off very well at first. That was later reconciled in later years, but as we shall see here in a moment, the young Mark returned home early on Paul's first missionary journey, and Paul didn't take very well to that. Um, It caused not just hard feelings between Paul and Mark that lasted for years, but also between Paul and Barnabas, who defended his young cousin. Uh, It was an unfortunate situation that happened, but again, it shows that uh, these people were people. They were human. No different than than, than people today. From Acts 13.13, uh, here where Mark is referred to as John. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, apparently, uh, Mark's leaving... Uh, it doesn't say in full detail the circumstances or why or what, but whatever it was, it was something that lasted for years, uh, the memory of it. Because years later, uh, as we read here in, in Acts 15, 36 to 40, it was all still, still a problem. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city, where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, so who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark, and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Cyrus, Silas, and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So it's an unfortunate incident, but again, it, it, it isn't all that surprising. You have to remember that these people had a job to do. They were facing trouble wherever they went, deadly trouble. And you just couldn't have to be worrying about who's going to stay with you and who isn't. So Paul was not entirely wrong in that sense but he needed a little more reassurance that that young Mark uh, was getting his his act together so to speak or acts together uh, which he did eventually and and they they were reconciled Um, it's just an unfortunate situation but again as I said it shows that the people of history were real people and they had disagreements just as people do today the trouble there uh, a number of things really caused it, but Paul uh, was new and zealous. Uh, He never lost that zealousness, by the way. He was strong. He had to be. He had to be. And people who who, who were given to do what they were doing, they just couldn't take a well, whatever will be, will be sort of attitude. They had a job to do, and they were going to do it. And Paul was an intense man. He was intense. Uh, And not that there's anything wrong with that either, because sometimes you have to be in order to get things done, even though uh, you may be facing a lot of opposition. You have to do that, do what you have to do. And if the opposition doesn't get out of your way, uh, you go right through them or over them or whatever you have to do. And, And that's the way it is. You can't turn back when you're preaching the gospel. There's only one way, and that's straight ahead. No matter what gets in the the way, you keep going. And that's what Paul did. And it's eventually what Mark did, and Barnabas, and all the rest. Uh, But they had to work on their own uh, in that sense, because they were intense people. Uh, And keep in mind, these were people who uh, were facing death. They were actually threatened with death a number of times people tried to kill them, literally tried to kill them, for just doing what we're doing here today, just preaching the gospel. I mean, it's not come to that here yet. Hopefully it never will. 
But in the end, Paul uh, was an intense man. And at the same time, in that early at that early point, Mark was still young. He was new. Uh, he just didn't have his 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 self together yet as well as Paul did. And poor Barnabas, he was caught in the middle. Barnabas was the one that brought Paul to the apostles when Paul was first converted. And the apostles at that time remembered Paul as an enemy of Christianity. So Paul, uh, Barnabas had, a, had, had an investment in Paul, so to speak, and at the same time he was caught between his young cousin, Mark. So it, it was not an easy situation for anybody. Paul, uh, Barnabas had to make a choice and he chose his young cousin because he knew Paul could look after himself whereas young Mark well he needed a little little help yet and eventually he grew to be just as capable as the rest so Barnabas did make the right choice and Paul uh, he does seem very hard headed uh, in this situation but again keep in mind what Paul had to do what was he was given to do so, it, it, it not unchristian in what it was doing. They, they had a mission and they were doing it. Years later, as I said, uh, Mark was with Paul. And they did regard themselves as friends at that time. In, in Colossians 4.10, uh, Paul speaks of Mark with, with good goodness, fondness and respect. When he said, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching ye who have received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. So Mark was with him at that time. So Mark simply grew, and he was able to stand with them. Uh, Nevertheless, Mark's alienation with Paul may be the reason that Mark looked to Peter, uh, not only as a mentor, during those wilderness years, so to speak, but as a source of information that he would use in the Gospel book of Mark. Peter called Mark, Marcus, my son, uh, in a figurative sense in 1 Peter 5.13, perhaps because he converted him, perhaps because uh, he he fulfilled the role of of a father. Uh, We don't know what happened to, to, uh, to Mark's actual father. And so, Peter was there to teach him and also to provide him with the information that may well uh, have made it into the Gospels. Many people have wondered why it is that one of the Gospel books wasn't written by Peter. Uh, I I must admit, I've, I've wondered why. How very little, so very little is written about or by Peter and we found here, and this is not from the Bible, but it's a quote from uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, which is logical, and uh, many Bible historians and theologians do give it merit. Uh, and I will quote it here. Clement of Alexandria, however, affirms that the gospel was written during Peter's lifetime. Here is the, his statement. When Peter had proclaimed the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel under the influence of the Spirit, as there was a great number present, they requested Mark to reduce these things to writing, and that after composing the gospel, he gave it to those who requested it of him, which then Peter understood he directly neither hindered nor encouraged it. So, essentially this is saying that Mark used Peter as a source of information. And why not? Uh, Certainly Peter was more familiar with with what is there, what is covered in the book, uh, in Mark's book, makes sense in terms of Peter being a source of information. And it is accurate. Uh, There's nothing there that is not found in the other, other gospel accounts. So it could very well be and if it is the way it turned out, it would also explain why Peter uh, is not found in terms of the gospel record, or why there isn't a gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Peter, or something like that. Uh, because maybe there is. Maybe there is. Uh, Peter was not 
a writer. Uh, he, he has very brief epistles in the New Testament, and they appear also to be dictated. Uh, so, really, it just makes sense that Peter was not a writer. Uh, he was a man of action. He was an apostle, but he wasn't a writer, unlike, for example, Luke the doctor or Matthew the tax collector. Peter was a fisherman. Uh, he was not a writer. He may not have been all that literate. And so writing and, and keeping in mind, very few people then were able to write. It isn't just something as though Peter was, was somehow unique in, in that regard. Most people were not writers. So to have someone uh, used to record that information for him, possibly, or, as, or at least in part, would make sense. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and it would explain why it would seem that so little of Peter is found in the New Testament, uh, when in fact a lot more may be there than, than, than we expect. So much of it was written by Paul, began keeping in mind uh, Paul was a Pharisee. Uh, he had a great deal of formal education. Peter didn't. Most of the others didn't. So, and even John didn't really, but John again had lots of time to learn, uh, whereas Peter didn't have as much during that the years that that followed. Uh, we don't know uh, what happened to Mark again for sure from a, from the Bible, uh, but the Clement the the connection there to Clement of Alexandria uh, is also interesting in that by most accounts uh, Mark was martyred there eventually. Specifically, he was torn to pieces by a mob uh, after he preached against their idols. So, although uh, Mark started out uh, quite green, uh, he grew to be a fearless man of God, one way or the other. He would have been martyred. There's no way you can get around that. Next, uh, Luke. Uh, Luke's writing ability seems to continue uh, that same theme, uh, in that just as Mark may have recorded some or much of what Peter witnessed and the others, uh, so too Luke the doctor, uh, a man very skilled at writing and keeping records and so on, may have recorded for others. And it certainly appears, according to what he wrote, uh, that that's exactly what happened. Uh, in Luke's own words from Luke 1, 1 to 3, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou might mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Uh, it's interesting how Luke refers to others providing the gospel information there. Uh, again, to repeat from verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, whereas for himself he claims only to have understood from the beginning. Uh, from verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. And all of this makes perfect sense. Uh, Luke was a Gentile. He was a convert. Uh, he would not have, have been with the apostles intimately as close as Peter would have been, or whether those many, many witnesses would have been. Yeah, keeping in mind, it wasn't just the twelve apostles. Uh, who witnessed everything that Christ did, there was a very large number of people, uh, men and women, uh, who witnessed it all. And that is who Luke is obviously referring to there. There were a lot of witnesses running around. The four gospel accounts aren't just the accounts of four men. The eyewitness accounts of four men. The, they represent the eyewitness accounts of thousands of people, men and women who witnessed everything that Christ said, everything that Christ did. That is how also the gospel accounts can be so detailed uh, in that not one one individual witness 
could have seen personally everything that is in a gospel account that that they've written about. Uh, if you read them, you can see that there's no way that one man, a single individual, could have witnessed the complete range of things that only, for example, when at the resurrection, when uh, when Christ, the risen Christ, spoke with Mary of Magdala, those were the only two people there. So certainly Mary, Mary of Magdala, uh, that lady who was the very first human being who witnessed the risen Christ, her account is in those Gospels. It's her too. And, and, and of all of the others, uh, Martha and Mary and, and all those people, they've all witnessed it and their accounts Again, to read uh, what Luke wrote here, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. So, all of those people, all of those witnesses, you can't have hundreds of different authors. That You would simply have chaos. But like Mark, so too Luke wrote for the, all of those people. And again, he was chosen. Why? Because he was a man skilled in writing, a man skilled in in record keeping, a man who could write in an orderly fashion uh, for a lot of people. And that's what he did. It's a surprising thing because most of us, we do. We think of the gospel accounts as simply the, the, the eyewitness accounts of four men. And that's what they are, but they're far more. Far, far more. Do you think all the all the that Mary of Magdala's account isn't in the Gospels? Surely it is. It has to be. She was the only one that saw Christ. She was the first human being to find the risen Christ. So her account has to be in there. It must be. And yet Mary herself may not have known how to write because most people couldn't at that time. Most people couldn't. So, uh, as as is the case with with Luke, or, or with with Matthew the tax collector, Luke, a man skilled in writing, was chosen by the Lord to do that job for all of those people to get it down in writing, in, in a very orderly fashion, and it just makes simple logic. If you were going to do it, that's exactly the way to do it. And it, again, it's just important to keep in mind how many witnesses there were of all that Christ said, all that Christ did. That's why their accounts are so perfect and so complete. No single individual witness could have been there for all of what is written there. But many, many witnesses, and that's what Luke just said, as we just read. There were many, many people who witnessed Christ's ministry, and it is those people who are speaking to us from those gospel accounts. It's also uh, should be kept in mind that Luke wrote the book of Acts as well uh, as a continuation of his gospel account. Uh, we know that he wrote both because he dedicated it just as an author uh, uh, would dedicate a book, if you want to look at it that way, to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus. Both the gospel book of Luke and the book of Acts are written to Theophilus. Um, from Luke 1 3 it seemed good to me also having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed uh, that was from Luke 1 3 to 4 and then continuing from Acts 1 1 to 3 the former treaties have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, in whom, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So again, what Luke is just plainly saying there, he has written written an official record of the eyewitness accounts of all of those people. That's what we just read here in Acts 1, 1 to 3. All of those witnesses. That's why the gospel accounts are so complete. 
why they have the color and depth that they do because so many people actually wrote it that's how he did it it wasn't just four men writing four eyewitness accounts there were a lot of people hundreds of people thousands of people um, and so also uh, like the others uh, Luke's style is unique it shows that he was the author uh, and that he presented his information in a way that is unique to that particular man in a way that is un- unlike the other three and the reason again is because it gives us a better picture a more complete picture Luke's perspective as a doctor and as a Gentile uh, provide a much wider view of the events of the life of Jesus Christ uh, Luke also uh, has more to say about the women of the early church and that doesn't mean that the other three gospel writers didn't but rather that they each had their own perspective their own angle of looking at things and uh, perhaps it was because he was a Greek perhaps it was because he was a doctor but he, he Luke did seem to have a greater appreciation and a greater recognition of the role of women in the church and although the others did as well uh, it's something that Luke seems to, to focus more clearly on and of course his accounts of, of the uh, the birth of Christ uh, he would likely very 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 likely uh, have spoken uh, in detail about that with Mary the mother of Jesus that is almost a certainty as well as, as likely did Matthew but uh, Luke uh, would seem to be a more of a natural in that sense so but further uh, he, he was likely also as we said a convert he was a Gentile he was not a Jew he was likely a convert of Paul because he remained very close to Paul and that was not an easy thing to do as I said Paul was an intense man he was a nice man I would love to have had Paul as a friend but he was intense uh, just to use that word he, he, he w- there would have been times where uh, as long as your dedication to God and to the word of God remained at a high level you probably would have been able to get along with Paul but if you any have, ever have a time where you let that slip a little bit uh, I think Paul would have ate you alive and that doesn't that I'm not talking knocking Paul but I'm just saying he he had his eye on the ball he knew where he was going and he just made sure that he never let down on that he was as zealous as a Christian as he was as a Pharisee when he was persecuting Christians and again that's likely why he was chosen but he was an intense man and Luke uh, apparently was able to keep up with that uh, although Luke didn't have that intensity in terms in that in that way but he stayed with him in fact uh, as we read here uh, at the end only Luke Luke was the last one uh, at least in, in the in the epistle to Timothy Paul said only Luke is with me so they were that doesn't mean he drove everybody away um, but a lot of them had had grown to the point where they were off serving uh, the gospel on their own uh, given to do because they knew Paul probably wasn't going to be free anymore and they just had to do what they had to do uh, when that time came as did Luke eventually but Luke traveled with uh, and remained with the apostle Paul to the end and as referred to uh, spoken of in Paul's epistles various epistles um, from Philemon 124 Marcus Aristarchus Demas Lucas my fellow laborers and from Colossians 414 Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you uh, and you'll notice as time goes on here there's fewer and fewer people uh, in the first reference there were five of them or four of them uh, in this one here there's only two and in the last reference to Timothy 411 Paul writes only Luke is with me so one by one by one um, there were fewer people and Luke was the last one so he was a very loyal man very brave man and if he was converted by Paul certainly there is a reason that, that he would have that view um, 
I, I, I'm starting to hear this more and more from daily Bible study as well. People who, who look, who learn something from daily Bible study, and they 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 are very thankful for that, and that's very good. I, I certainly do appreciate that when people write and do that, but they should never forget that it's the Holy Bible that you're learning from, and it's the Holy Spirit that's enabling you to see it. People are just people. They're nothing more. Uh, don't revere people. Don't don't make somebody into an idle shepherd uh, because that's not doing you any good. It's not doing them any good. And sooner or later, it's just going to get out of hand when you do that. Look to the Word of God and look to God, not to some man or some human anywhere. Luke apparently stayed with Paul to the end, uh, and then after Paul's martyrdom, uh, Luke continued preaching on his own, apparently, uh, and having completed uh, providing us with the Gospel book of Luke and the book of Acts, uh, one tradition holds that Luke was hanged in Greece. So, as with the rest, martyred him again. And the Apostle John, uh, who was the son of Zebedee and Salome, and who was the brother of James. Both John and James were among the twelve apostles. And John was unique. He was close to Jesus. He was chosen by Jesus to take care of Mary. And he was closer, or as close as anyone uh, to Jesus was. John was a fisherman, as were at least three of the other twelve apostles. And as such, John had much in common with them. But as we said, John was unique uh, among the apostles for other reasons. Jesus Christ and the Apostle John were cousins, actual cousins. Proof of that is not as obvious uh, because the proof... Uh, is in pieces uh, in the scriptures but it's easy to see when you line up those pieces uh, as we'll just do quickly here first standing among the women near the cross with Jesus mother Mary was Salome as identified by the apostle Mark in his gospel account and she was Mary's sister uh, as the apostle John himself states in his gospel account uh, which, as it turns out, is he was speaking of his own mother. Uh, Mark's gospel account refers to her by name, and John's gospel account refers to her by her relationship to Mary. So you see how the two gospel accounts and those two pieces, you, you just merely need to put them together and you see what they're saying. So therefore, Salome was Jesus' aunt. Uh, the two scriptures. John 19.25 Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. And from Mark 15.40 There were also women, women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome. So you see John refers uses the, the, the term his mother's sister while Mark says Salome, so you know that that Salome was Jesus' mother's sister, so therefore Jesus' aunt. So it's very simple when you put the two together. And yet people have read those so many times, I know I did, uh, and when they're widely spaced apart in the two different Gospels, one uses the term his mother's sister, and the other uses the, the actual name Salome, and you just don't see it, because and it's natural. And there's a lot of those in the Bible to be discovered many, many of them yet. Uh, I, I come across them, and people write to me uh, who've come across them, uh, things like that. A lot of those discoveries are still there. From that first part, we know that Salome was Mary's sister. Now, the second Salome uh, is then also identified as the wife of Zebedee, as, as John is identified as the son of Zebedee. So what does that tell you immediately? Uh, the picture is then complete. Uh, Salome, Salome is identified as Mary's sister and John's mother. 
and John was therefore Jesus' cousin. Uh, you may have to wind this back if you're listening to it in a recording, uh, but it's there. It's, it's just a, a, a small handful of verses, and suddenly it's, it's just right there, plain as day. It was from that family relationship uh, that Jesus was the reason that Jesus instructed that Mary was to go and live out her life with the Apostle John uh, as though uh, he were her son as well. Now, that's simply how things were done uh, and, and still are in many, many countries. You don't, people are not sent away uh, to live in old folks' homes or sent away to live in institutions of sort. You simply go and live with family and that's the way it's done in a lot of countries. Uh, the modern world uh, doesn't seem to have that same sort of responsibility or, or kinship or responsibility, although certainly many people do. But it's just our society doesn't seem to, to have that perspective any longer. Uh, that responsibility, though, that, that where Mary was to go and live with John pretty much guaranteed John a long life. Uh, simply because John and Jesus were about the same age and Mary was only a teenager when when she became the mother of Jesus so therefore uh, Mary would have been only somewhat less than 20 years older than John probably less than 20 years probably 16, 17 years older than John so at least, and as it turns out, that's what happened. Uh, John was well into his 90s when he wrote the book of Revelation, was given to write the book of Revelation uh, near the end of the first century. And John lived to be well over 90. And Mary may be the reason for that. I don't think she would have been martyred. I don't think so. Um, although she certainly could have been she was, although from the accounts we read of her in the in the Bible, um, she was not uh, as outgoing in terms of preaching the gospel. Just based on what we're reading, uh, she was close with the church. She was prominent in the church. She would certainly have been highly respected in the church. Although she would not have been idolized as as some churches do at the moment, there wouldn't have been any little statues of her anywhere. That's for sure, because if there were, I'm sure Mary would have herself done something so that they weren't around anymore. And, but again, that's another story. But anyway, if, if she were to make it to at least 80, and I'm sure she must have, uh, that would put John in his mid 90s, and that's what happened. He did live that to that to that age. The Gospel book of John, uh, during which he wrote. Uh, during those years, the Gospel Book of John, as we said, does have a different perspective uh, than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are the so-called synoptic Gospels. Uh, there is no contradiction or conflict between them, between John and the other three, but rather it's written, uh, shall we say, in a somewhat more spiritual way, uh, not meaning that it was any more a product of the Holy Spirit's guidance in, in writing it than the other three, uh, but John uses terms that are found only in John. Uh, for example, uh, in his reference to uh, the Logos of God uh, in referring to Christ's pre-human existence. The principle of the Logos is actually found throughout the Bible. Uh, but only in John's Gospel will you find, for example, uh, here from John 1, 1 to 12, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And continuing, and of course that's speaking of Jesus Christ. And nowhere will you find that in other places in the Bible, in as specific and as plain as day as that. Um, and in, and continuing on just to make sure that absolutely certain that he's talking about Jesus and the word be, was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as the one and only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so in that sense 
the book of John is unique, but it's not unique in that it's somehow different or, or contradictory to the rest of the Bible. All of what the purpose of those four gospel writers are, those four very different men, representing the writings and the witness of thousands of people, as we've seen. The, the four Gospels aren't just the eyewitness accounts of just four men. They are the eyewitness accounts of thousands of men and women that are provided there. As we said, people like Mary Magdalene, she was the only one who spoke with Jesus that day. She's the only one that know what was know what was said. So she had to have told them. So that's Mary there. And if Mary was not someone who could write as most people weren't then uh, it was given to a, a former tax collector someone who could write or to a doctor and so on or John who was who had lots of time to learn and and, and th- that's simply how it turned out just four orderly accounts uh, of the witness of, of many many people uh, it was put together in that way and so it's more than just those those four men what it really all what it gives us is like a stereo view of 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 what we're reading in the gospel books because there's no way that any individual could have seen everything in any individual book and it gives us really a greater depth of understanding of this wonderful and sacred book and it's all the truth because it isn't just four witnesses it's thousands of witnesses people who many many of them uh, died for that truth they preached it right to their deaths and you don't do that for something that you don't know is true people don't die for a lie they die for the truth when they see their fellows martyred they don't then go and get themselves martyred for something that they know isn't true. And those people knew it was true. They saw it with their own two eyes. They walked with Christ. They listened to Him. They knew exactly what He looked like. They knew exactly what His voice sounded like. They saw His miracles. They saw Him crucified. They saw Him dead hanging on that cross. And later on, they saw him rise up from the dead and they saw him alive and they spoke with him and it's their account that's found in those gospel books it's the truth they all went through a lot to witness what they did for us and have it recorded for us so that we too may see and believe just like they did those people went through a lot for us to provide us with this book. I hope and we pray to God that we never disappoint them. That we never disappoint. They're witnessing that for us so that we can believe as they did. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy truly complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.